Today's lecturer is another distinguished art, art historian, and I'm going to ask Maki Fukuoka, uh, who uh, teaches visual culture in our Department of Asian Languages and Cultures, to uh, introduce the speaker to you today. Hi, um, I'm Maki Fukuoka, and it's really wonderful to see so many of you here today. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Christine Guth, today's uh, lecturer. Uh, she was initially tr st uh, trained in France and Belgium studying Oriental history, Asian history, and later received her PhD in fine arts from Harvard University. Since then, she has contributed tremendously to the field of Japanese visual culture in multiple forms, uh, publications, teaching, and curation. Um, her book, uh, there, there are many books that she single authored but also edited. Uh, one of the ones that I was very inspired by uh, is called Longfellow's Tattoos, Tourism, Collecting in Japan. Um, Christine has also taught Japanese visual culture at many prominent institutions, including Princeton, UC Berkeley, and Stanford. She comes to Ann Arbor today for the first time uh, from Royal College of Art and Victoria and um, <coughs> sorry, Albert Museum in London, where she has been teaching since fall 2007. And there she is the head of Asian Design History Specialism, uh, a very curious title. One of the consi consistent themes that emerged from Christine's work is the dynamic historical flow of the notion of culture and authenticity. What are the logics that define, identify, and preserve a nation's cultural authenticity? And it comes in the forms of tattoo, clothing, as well as act of collecting, and the person who is in charge of collection. Um, her analytical eye and innovative method connects dots among objects, both typical and atypical, people both famous and forgotten, and places both in Japan and outside that ask us to challenge our own notions of culture and authenticity as it relates to Japan, and clears the way for us to think about how we might envision Japanese culture or Japanese visual culture in ways that hasn't been done before. And I'm one of the very many uh, students of hers in a way that we've been very much inspired uh, with her very innovative methodological works. So please join me in welcoming Christine Guth. Thank you, Maki. I think that's one of the most thoughtful introductions anyone has ever given me. It was <laughs> very moved. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. I, I want to thank the Center for Japanese Studies for inviting me. But I also want to thank all of you for coming because this is a day when you want to be outside. <laughs> and so I, I, th I thank you for, for making time and for coming inside on a day when it's so exceptionally warm. In fact, I'm storing up the warmth and the nice weather to take with me back to London. Um, the one thing that I can promise you is that although, uh, that I will take you outdoors, I will take you to the seaside today. You will be seeing lots of scenes of, of the sea. And perhaps that will provide a little bit of compensation for not actually being outdoors. Um, let me see if I can get my get myself started here. Um, okay, now let me see. I will get myself up to slideshow. Um, standard, presumably. I'm a Mac user, so I'm not. F5. Okay. Try it again. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about Hokusai's great waves, but I'm going to speak about them from perhaps a slightly different perspective than, than you are familiar with them. Over the course of a can you all hear me? Over the course of a career spanning nearly seven decades, Hokusai produced image after image of waves. 
No other artist before him engaged so obsessively or so creatively with his subject. There are scenic views of waves breaking on the shore at Enoshima, book illustrations of waves identified with legendary feats of heroism and self-sacrifice, designs of waves for the decoration of personal accessories and architectural interiors, instructional manuals with incoming and outgoing waves, depictions of waves in the formal, semi-formal, and cursive brush styles, a boat fighting waves to get into the famous cave of the three deities, rabbits leaping over waves, ghosts haunting the waves where ships had foundered, a wave seemingly morphing into plovers, male and female waves, 1,000 images of the sea, a series whose title, Chie no Umi, might be understood uh, acoustically to mean wisdom of the sea, and even a Taoist magician conjuring up waves from the palm of his hand. But none of these has achieved the enduring popularity or international reputation of Under the Wave of Kanagawa, issued probably in 1831 as part of Hokusai's series, The 36 Views of Mount Fuji. How are we to interpret this explosion of interest in representing waves, and how does it relate to Hokusai's signature print? In my talk today, I want to propose that while modern admiration of its striking formal qualities has led under the wave off Kanagawa to be singled out as the great wave, it is in fact but one of many renditions of a motif that registered a new maritime turn in Japanese cultural formations from around the 1790s through the 1850s. Now waves, of course, had already a rich and complex history in Japanese literature and visual arts and religion as well. But during this critical period, internal and external events combined to make views of the coastline, ships, and warriors battling at sea critical sites through which artists articulated their nation's shifting geopolitical circumstances. The gargantuan wave became a conspicuous presence in such scenes, a metonymic expression of Japan's geophysical vulnerabilities that prompted questions about the consequences of engaging in relations with countries beyond its shore, while simultaneously representing a site of resistance to aggressive foreign export e efforts to open its ports. Widely disseminated in the form of prints and illustrated books, Hokusai's great waves should be understood, I believe, as part of the discourse on the so-called kaikoku, or opening of Japan. Tokugawa Japan was not a seafaring nation, the shogunate having banned the construction of large ships and forbidden, on pain of death, those who left the country from re-entering. Ships sailing for, Dutch, for the Dutch East India Company were allowed once yearly to enter the southern port of Nagasaki. But by the last quarter of the 18th century, Russian, American, and British ships were also demanding entry into other Japanese ports. Sightings of foreign naval ships off the Izu and Boso Peninsula leading to the bay that gave access to the shogunal city of Edo caused particular concern. In this map, you see the Boso Peninsula circled. Some government officials alerted the shogunate that encroaching foreign forces demanded a new outlook on Japan's watery periphery. In 1791, for instance, Hayashi Shihei wrote Military Talks for a Maritime Nation, Kaikoku Heidan, which opens with the question, what is meant by a maritime nation? And goes on to address the defense preparations needed by a country bordered on all sides by the sea. Meanwhile, others spoke to the necessity of developing international commercial shipping and trade. As Sato Nobuhiro put it in his abbreviated History of the Western Powers of 1808, Seiyo Rekokushi uh, Ryaku, I quote, there is nothing that compares with shipping and commerce to strengthen greatly a nation's interests, end quote. The rumored threat 
of a Russian invasion, followed in 1804 by the so-called Rezanov Affair, in which a Russian diplomat landed in Nagasaki in the hopes of opening trade negotiations but was turned away, further fueled anxieties. Such threats led in 1825 to a shogunal edict ordering foreign vessels entering Japanese ports to be fired on, as was the American ship Morrison when it entered Uraga Bay in 1837, using the return of seven shipwrecked sailors, um, Japanese sailors, as a pretext for initiating trade. Even as real ships loomed on the horizon, popular literature and the visual arts were invaded by a legendary band of outlaws from China's periphery in the vernacular novel The Water Margin, Suikoden. Its, ja its martial and patriotic subjects spawned numerous literary adaptations, as well as dramatic prints of its 108 protagonists. Many of these showed the muscular outlaw heroes fighting evildoers in and even underwater, both of which were dramatically new modes of treating warriors in Japanese prints. Their enduring hold on the public imagination had much to do with Hokusai's illustrations for Taki, uh, Takizawa Bakin's immensely popular translation of this novel, which was serialized for over a quarter of a century from 1805 to 38. And this is one of um, many of the illustrations from it. At a time when Japan turned to China for mentorship, the loyalty and bravery of the protagonists of the water mod, uh, margin modeled the superhuman strength and moral authority needed both to fight shogunal corruption and to protect the nation against foreign enemies. Their stories, in turn, <coughs> served as the impetus for new versions of ancient Japanese tales of valor set on Japan's own periphery signaling the maritime turn in which Hokusai's great waves became dramatis personae. Hokusai reinterpreted waves by representing them in relation to recognizable physical environments. Earlier, <coughs> waves had been chiefly metaphors of loss and longing, of fear of foreign travel, of exile, and above all, of Buddhist transients. But in Hokusai's work, the aesthetic structure of a single isolated wave was celebrated within specific locations in time and space. By combining traditional decorative styles with the empiricism of Western prints and illustrated books, this artist brought the wave into dialogue with Japan's, with the pressing issue of Japan's place in the modern world. This, press, this sweeping view of Seven League Beach, Chichirigahama at Enoshima, with the shrine of Benten and Mount Fuji in the distance, where Hokusai's great wave made its first appearance in 1797, speaks to a key locale in which this motif's historical and spatial identity was newly constitu constituted. Waves breaking on the shore of the scenic spot near Edo were a feature of many woodblock prints. But Hokusai's illustration in Threads of the Willow, Yanagi no Ito, an album of comic verse, Kyoka, was unusual in its mobilization of Western perspective in combination with a single outsized wave in the foreground. Arrested in motion at the moment of its cresting, this wave is made to look three-dimensional in a way that makes it as conspicuous a presence as the landscape, in the landscape as Mount Fuji. Despite his study of principles of European linear perspective to situate objects in space, Hokusai deliberately exaggerated the relationships of scale here so that the wave competes for attention with a distant cone of the sacred volcano, something that he would also do later in his great wave, as I will discuss in a few moments. Hokusai's chief objective in creating this wor work was likely to have been a desire to exploit the rising tide of enthusiasm for Western idioms introduced by, among others, Shiba Kokan, whose so-called Dutch style view of the Seven League Beach with Mount Fuji in the distance, Hokusai may have seen because it was on display at the Atagoyama Shrine. And this is Kokan's twofold screen. But Kokan's work was painted in materials that simulate the effects of oil, quite different from the print that I just showed you. 
It was presented to the shrine's votive hall the year before Hokusai presented, uh, published his own print. Enoshima was an appropriate site to experiment with new modes of uh, visual representation because this site, which was within a day's journey from Edo, was a popular place of outings, often under the guise of pilgrimage to the shrine of Benten, the goddess of wealth, love, and seafarers. It was a public stage where contact between strangers could take place and where men and women of different classes exposed themselves to the gaze of others. Pilgrims could only reach the shrine at low tide and had to leave before the tide turned. This tenuous relationship with the mainland, I think, made Enoshima a particularly suitable site to try out foreign representational codes. Hokusai used this and other variations of the Great Wave time and again in various combinations. In addition to be highly, being highly topical, its redeployment reflected practical considerations. Hokusai, like many woodblock print artists, was under constant pressure to supply his publisher with new, de with new, new designs, and one successful print generated demand for another. I think such considerations help to explain his multiple renditions of ships in stormy seas, a theme that he first tried out in view of Homoku of Kanagawa, and small cargo boats passing through waves, the two prints that you see here. Both in very similar horizontal formats, they were printed around 1800 to 1805 and were part of a series of views of Edo and its environs. View of Homoku, which you see on the upper right, um, features a large vessel equipped with a mast and sail. The second woodcut shows the more vulnerable small skiffs, Oshio Kuribune, that carried fresh fish between the Boso Peninsula and the shogunal city of Edo. These are the same type of boat that would reappear 25 years later in Under the Wave off Kanagawa. In these views of boats pitching and diving into the trough between giant waves, fact and fantasy combine to give metaphoric expression to the costs and benefits of the flow of people and goods from abroad. The horizontal format, brown and green color scheme, suggesting copper plate prints, the decorative frame sur surrounding the image, all of these recall imported Dutch prints. This reference to the West is made even more explicit in the view of the skiffs by the sideways written yokogaki inscription simulating cursive writing in, in Roman letters. An illustration in Strange Tales of Northern Echigo, Hokuetsu Kidan of 1813, represents another geographically specific variation on the Great Wave theme. The Japan Sea off Echigo and modern-day Niigata Prefecture is notorious for its turbulence, and tales of sightings of phantom ships, Yurefuna, circulated widely in its coastal communities. In this version, a certain captain, Magosuke, has had an encounter with a ghost ship, but overcomes its threat by his fervent prayers. Hokusai's terrifying vision sets the ghost ship atop a towering, unstable mountain of frothy water with an ominous black sky animated by eerie-looking storm clouds behind it. The phantom ship, which recurs in a number of Hokusai's prints, speaks pointedly to the fantasies and nightmares that the giant wave could arouse in Edo period Japan. Although sailing out of sight of land was rare in the Edo period, harrowing accounts of boats swept off course by a typhoon or the currents was all too common, making ships in stormy seas inauspicious pictorial subjects. None of the boats in the three designs that I've just shown is Dutch, a feature that in all likelihood would have rendered them too politically loaded. But the representation of a real boat in storm-tossed seas was a new theme that was likely informed by Hokusai's familiarity with a Dutch engraving or possibly a Japanese copy of one. 
In the 17th century, Dutch artists were recognized throughout Europe as masters of marine painting. And the repertory of Hendrik Vroom, Albert Kuyp, Willem uh, van de Velde the Elder and his son, and even Rembrandt included many uh, views of s ships in stormy seas. And I show you here just two examples. Uh, the one on the upper left is um, by Vroom, and the one on the lower left is by, um, by Rembrandt. Oops, I need to go back here. Hoxai also put great waves to imaginative use in epic tales about Chinese and Japanese warriors, most notably in the illustration to Takizawa Bakin's epic Strange Tales of the Crescent Moon, which was serialized from 1807 until 1811. Let me see if I've got the, oh, this painting that you see here. Um, shows the, the 12th century hero of this serialized novel, uh, Minamoto no Tametomo, demonstrating his skill with a bow to the demons of Onoshima Island. Um, and it's a painting that was commissioned upon the completion of the serialized novel, um, commissioned by uh, Bakin himself. And it's a painting that's now in the British Museum. Um, Bak uh, Bakin's serialized version of the adventures of Tametomo were accompanied by many, many illustrations featuring dramatic views of the coast, of boats fighting and succumbing to storming seas, and even of the hero swimming against the current, as you see here. But none of these has the graphic impact of the scene of Tametomo's loyal retainer, Takama Isohagi, committing suicide. Standing on a rocky promontory with his dead wife at his feet, Isohagi plunges a sword into his gut, the erotic violence of the gesture redoubled by the tumescent wave that is about to break over him. This drama of physical destruction and spiritual renewal is reiterated in the spindrift, which seems to spray like blood from his arched body. Suicide, of course, was the warrior's ultimate sacrifice. And as the site of purification rituals, the seaside was an appropriate place to carry out such an act. But the imaginative power of this juxtaposition of man and wave draws on the physical force of the wave as a metaphoric double for the warrior. With this symbiosis, Hoxai introduced a new image of masculinity that would be mobilized in many contexts and against many enemies, the unseen forces of the natural world, but also those of foreign powers. It is no accident that Yoko Tadanori lifted this nationalistic motif from Hoxai's illustration for his 1969 poster for um, Yukio Mishima's kabuki play based on Chinsetsu Yomihari no Tsuki. It perfectly expresses the desire for a beautiful death, a beautiful and violent death, that was such a powerful current running through Mishima's writings. And apparently Mishima um, dictated exactly what subject matter should appear in this poster. So this was, this was not specifically Yoko Tadanori's vision, but reflected um, Mishima's own view of what was important in, in um, Chinsetsu Yumi Hanyotsuki. Fiction and its illustration, of course, are powerful tools for giving shape to new ideas. And in his retelling of the battles between the Taira and the Minamoto clans, Bakin capitalized on the way myth can give collective expression to actual social experience and material conditions. In the historical account, Tametomo, 12th century warrior on the losing side of the Hogan Rebellion, was sent into exile on the island of Oshima, where he committed suicide. But in Bakin's 19th century reinterpretation, the seven foot tall hero does not die in exile, but escapes by sea only to fall victim to a storm that causes his ship to go off course, landing in the Ryukyu Islands, where after overcoming a demon, he marries a local princess. This reciting is significant. The narrative of strange tales of the crescent moon in which the hero Tametomo journeys beyond Honshu to take controls of island, take control of islands, real and imaginary, transposes the classic 
themes of heroism and self-sacrifice into a newly expanded geographic framework. The narrative is no longer, the 12th century narrative is no longer centered on Kyoto, although the imperial presence is important, but directed instead towards the subjugation of islands once defined by their difference or exclusion from the mental universe of civilized Japanese. Until this time, the Ryukyu Islands were taken for granted as Japanese tributaries. But with the periphery re-centered in the struggle to maintain Japanese territorial integrity, the seashore and naval battles assumed new prominence as symbolic proving grounds for warrior valor and honor. Tametomo's subjugation of the Ryukyus symbolically marked the expansionist scope of Japan's national vision at the very moment when control over the archipelago was in question. This politicization and militarization of littoral space is still more pronounced in a scene in Hokusai's Heroes of China and Japan illustrated, Wakan Ehon no Sakigake, one of a number of publications from his late years that celebrate the warrior exploits in highly original and imaginative ways. Hokusai is thought to have completed the illustrations in 1833 but the book's publication was interrupted by the restrictions of the tempo era reforms and it wasn't issued until posthumously in 1850 at a moment when the growing threat of western invasion made warrior exploits even more potent subject matter now the sea had long figured as a realm where mortals might discover the divine but such th encounters were gen generally required travel traveling either far out or deep beneath the sea. But in the episode now on the screen, the dragon king of the sea emerges from a great wave, breaking on the very shore where the warrior Nita no Yoshisada stands. This divine intervention, which recalls the kamikaze that destroyed the Mongol fleet, follows on Yoshisada's offering of his sword with prayers for the seas to recede so his army can capture Kamakura and restore Emperor Godaigo to power. The deity's appearance within a great wave aligns this motif with a larger set of moral values and meanings linked to Japan's mythic origins in the Age of the Gods. The shore, to be sure, had long figured as a liminal space, but the appearance of the sea god here, rather than deep in his palace beneath the sea, suggests, I think, a kind of blurring of the boundaries of land and sea, making what was previously invisible or unknown part of the here and now. Two worlds merge again around the wave in an illustration for an adaptation of the novel The Wars of Han and Chu Illustrated. Ehon Kanso Gundan, from um, 1843, where a fierce and resolute Chinese warrior facing a dragon is doubly empowered by his equine mount and the leaping wave behind it. Here, too, the artist is not simply representing the wave, but mobilizing it as a visual trope for its performative qualities. While the wave may function elsewhere as a sign signifier of the marauding fo foe, here, it connotes the hero's divinely charged to that foe, both by the symbolic action of its design and the agency of the gaze brought to it. This image aimed to keep alive Japanese spirit and valor at a time of growing threats to national security. Well, you are probably wondering by now where is under the wave off Kanagawa. <laughs> In 1831, a quarter of a century after his small cargo boat passing through waves and view of Homoku off Kanagawa, Hokusai reimagined a great wave with skiffs for his 36 views of Mount Fuji, a series which featured the mountain from various sites in and around Edo. Unlike the earlier versions, here the artist used the larger Oban format rather than the medium-sized Chuban format because it allowed far greater um, visual scope. So the two ones that you see belie beneath were roughly um, 8 by 11 inches, and the, the um, one with Mount Fuji above is about uh, 10 by 14 inches. The Great Wave in this 
view from the 36 views of Mount Fuji is no longer envisioned as a great mound of water with a toupee-like fringe as it is here, but really commands the picture plane dramatically overshadowing the distant peak of Mount Fuji. It also reconciles the essential contradictions between the movement of the water and the stillness of the mountain. And in so doing, the print captures and fixes the wave so that it paradoxically becomes a static, elegant, and poised structure rather than something fluid and ephemeral. While the wave's sheer scale and claw-like extensions are threatening, the potential for violence, I think, is tamed by the aesthetic artifice of making the smaller wave in the foreground a kind of visual double for Mount Fuji. Let me see if I can get this. This is what I'm talking about here. In the earlier versions, the viewer's gaze is deflected, the subject distanced and generalized. But here, the foregrounding of the curling wave with the small boats swallowed up by it draws the viewer into its orbit, creating an extraordinary immediacy of experience. The disturbingly low water-eye vantage point giving the illusion that we are seeing the wave from within its vortex, makes viewership essential to the performativity of this image in a way that was not true before. Further engaging our attention here is the uncertain fate of the boatmen struggling against the overwhelming force of this natural phenomenon. Their bobbing heads combine with the movement of the small vessels thrusting in and out of the wave to create a dialectic of revealing and concealing closeness and distance. This instability is reinforced by the use in the print's caption of the word nami ura, a cognate that may be interpreted to mean either beneath or behind the wave. As Time and Screech is written in another context, ura and its counterpart omote are highly charged words suggesting not simply back and front but the hidden truth behind the facade, which raises interesting interpretive questions as far as this print is concerned. While the skiffs facing the colossal waves are the familiar oshiokurebune, viewers of the time could not have failed to notice the unusual vantage point from which the familiar landmark of Mount Fuji is seen, one in which the gaze is not turned outward but inward towards Japan, suggesting the perspective of an invisible foreign ship. In addition, from the perspective of the Japanese viewer, the left to right movement of the wave was unnatural, since pictures were customarily read from right to left, and movement was customarily from right to left in emaki or other or hand, narrative hand scrolls. Like the horizontal writing, or yokogaki, which I spoke about earlier, this directional flow underscores the picture's identification with a European world. If this angle of vision suggests a longing for the larger world, the, ambitious fi the ambiguous fate of the boats confronting the overwhelming force of the wave also hits, hints at the potential dangers such engagement would entail. That such a dialogue could even be imagined was dependent on the reassurance provided by the familiar conical form of Mount Fuji in the distance. As these views from, Mount, from Hokusai's 36 views of Mount Fuji testify, by the 1830s, the 12,385-foot volcano, which was 62 miles southwest of the city of Edo, had been naturalized as part of the shared visual experience of all the city residents. One reason for this was that paradoxically, despite its volcanic nature, Mount Fuji was deemed immortal, fu shi, no death, being one of its popular etymologies, suggesting that even as the world around it might change, Fuji reassuringly does not. Indeed, the belief that Fuji's veneration could confer immortality on its devotees had made it the focus of a devotional cult with a wide regional following. Um, and both Hokusai and his publisher um, were, were part of this. 
It was this etymology that motivated Hokusai and his publisher to advertise the projected Fuji series as 36 in number, although in fact 46 prints were issued. This symbolic number linked the 36 views to the 36 immortals of poetry. Further contributing to the special place of this mountain in the popular imagination was the claim that it was Sangoku no Ichi, Sangoku Ichi no Yama, sorry, the tallest peak among the three countries of India, China, and Japan. By Hokusai's days, threats, external threats to Japan's integrity helped to give this pride in Fuji as a mountain with no equal increasingly nationalistic connotations. By its juxtaposition, I would like to argue that Hokus, Hokusai's immobile wave shared in both the national significance and the reassuring presence of Mount Fuji. While Hokusai's adoption of Western perspectival techniques throughout his 36 views of Mount Fuji might be understood as potentially threatening, by harnessing their exotic power for his own spectacular ends, he effectively contained their foreignness. His playful inversion of the stature of Mount Fuji and the wave firmly situated this image in the familiar cultural context of the theater and public performances, both of which were influential in shaping 19th century viewing habits. Hokusai himself was a master performer who well understood that sensational displays of artistic virtuosity on a grand scale were effective in capturing the attention of a novelty-loving public. In 1817, for instance, to promote the publication of a new volume of his manga, he had painted a 250 square foot image of the Buddhist deity Daruma, a feat commemorated in a souvenir print that carefully records um, the dimensions of the nose, the mouth, the eyes, and so forth. And you see the souvenir print on the lower right. The same defiance of the norms of scale also underlies Hokusai's Fuji series, where the artist seduces the viewer by theatricalizing the mountain and the wave. Just as Hokusai's, in his performance in Nagoya, extended the fictional space of, the, of artistic creation to include the viewer, so too, I would argue, this, the low water level vantage point that he adopted in Under the Wave of Kanagawa erases the boundaries between subject and object, transforming the spectator into a participate, participant in his watery drama. In effect, the wave sets, off <coughs> sets in motion a creative process that the viewer, that the beholder completes. Even as Hokusai trivializes the empirical value of Western illusionistic techniques, their appropriation also points to the irresistible power of globalization. By adopting perspectival principles, however playfully, this artist opened Japan to a new way of seeing that symbolically extended the viewer's own space into that of the larger world. That this was a world distinguished by its instability is suggested by the label ukie, floating picture, given the first Japanese prints, like the one now on the screen, that used these visual techniques. This doublantan pointed both to the floating world culture, which was the first site represented in this manner, as well as to the disorienting effects of these new illusionistic um, principles. As Kishi Fumikazo has, Fumikazo has observed, their association with distant regions is implicit in a broadsheet of 1739 in which we find the first reference to ukie, ukie. There, the reference to Ukie is significantly recorded between a reference to a sighting of a foreign ship and the return of shipwrecked Japanese sailors. So Japanese perspective thus represented seems to suggest a kind of window on the world that was also understood metaphorically as a larger opening, a kaikoku of the country. By regulating the totality of the experience of Mount Fuji from multiple vantage points through the use of illusionistic perspective in his 36 views, Hokusai likewise opened 
the beholder's eyes to new visual experiences of this national landmark. The intense blue used in Under the Wave of Kanagawa reinforces this experience of global connectivity. When the third publication of the 36 Views was announced in the back of a book of stories by Ryute Tanehiko, the prints were advertised as Aizuri-e, prints, pictures printed in blue against a white background, as seen in, a, in another view from the series, another example of this Aizuri-e technique. This identified the prints, Aizurie, the term Aizurie, identified the prints as being printed not with indigo, a natural dye that was locally produced, but with a newly imported aniline dye known in Japan as Bero, Berlin blue. This blue produced a far more intense saturated hue that was quite striking um, in, the, in the context of the times. Henry Smith's study of the blue revolution in prints has shown that Berlin blue was imported sporadically beginning in the 1780s and 90s, but it was only in the Bunse era from 1818 to the 1830 that large quantities of this exotic import made, uh, made available by Dutch and Chinese traders brought prices down sufficiently for its widespread use in prints. Berlin blue profoundly altered the meaning of the views of Japan with wi in which it was used because it didn't simply refer to the world beyond Japan's shores but might materialized it by making the medium part of the message. The vogue of Aizurie alerts us, I think, to the dangers of reading under the wave of Kanagawa with reference to starkly essentialist dichotomies of a closed or open nation. Hokusai's woodblock participated in a discourse in which the beholder, having imagined and experienced the world beyond, beyond home, could also experience the benefits of changes whose nature and pace are, pace are domestically framed. Berlin Blue gestures towards a way of seeing the outside world not as separate and remote from Japan, but as vitally connected through desirable commodities. Cultural boundaries play a crucial role in the preservation or transformation of a given worldview, one that often remains unexamined as long as the environment remains stable and ordered. When historical circumstances change, however, so too do behaviors and attitudes. Hokusai's great waves arose, I think, in just such a context. At a time when Japan was experiencing a crisis of confidence, they helped the viewing public come to terms with a world that was rapidly expanding by symbolically containing and making manageable the realities of globalization. The Great Wave's special resonance in the context of the times helps to explain why it was singled out for special attention by other artists and reiterated in such varied contexts. In the decades following the publication of Under the Wave of Kanagawa, Hokusai's great waves appeared in political broadsides, in the illus such as this one, which deals with a, um, a mudslide from Mount Fuji, in the illustrated biography of the monk Nichiren, in actor prints, where the actor's mie is likened to the frozen wave, as well, oh, and in, in Warrior prints, this is another view from um, Chinsetsu Yumi Hayonsuki, as well as in straightforward homage, like this um, view of the Great Wave um, from Hiroshige's 36 views of Mount Fuji. And these are just a few of the reiter reiterations of this motif that occurred between the 1830s and the 1850s. Oops. Immortal images may be those that touch us deeply, but they only become communal property through reiteration, a process that even as it may alter the meaning of the original, also so solidifies its place in the public eye. The iconicity of Hokusai's outsized waves in 19th century Japan was dependent on the accumulated power of multiple representations made possible by the woodblock print medium itself. Connecting people in widely disparate geographic and social, socio-cultural spaces, the circulation of these woodcuts of 
by Hoxai and by others who picked up this motif, I think can be seen as both symptoms and products of a far-reaching dialogue about the balance between the local and the global in an increasingly connected world. This dialogue between the local and the global is one that resonates still today. Thank you. Thank you.